What is up everyone? Welcome back to Great Ace TV and today I'm going to be talking about the Byron Smith killings that happened back in 2012 in Little Falls, Minnesota. And I actually very recently watched an episode about this case on the ID channel called 12 Minutes on Elm Street if any of you guys want to watch it. But that sort of piqued my interest about this and reminded me about this case that happened. And I decided to do a little more research on it and talk about it today. And the Byron Smith killings actually happened on Thanksgiving Day of 2012. And it involved Byron Smith, a 64 year old man at the time, who killed two teenagers who were both 17 and 18 who broke into his house. So prior to the actual murders, Byron Smith had claimed that his house had been broken into about half a dozen times in the span of a few months. Even though he had only reported one previous burglary to his house, to police. And investigators actually only found evidence of two previous break-ins. One of those having occurred in his garage, which when police brought this up to him, he had no knowledge of. And among the items stolen were $4,000 in cash, his father's POW watch that he got after being a prisoner of war in World War II, some of Byron's own military medals, which he got by serving in Vietnam, as well as a coin collection, a shotgun, and a chainsaw. And after those break-ins, Smith actually installed a security system and routinely began wearing a holster with a loaded gun inside his home, as well as stashing water bottles and granola bars in his basement. And on the surface that seems a little extreme but if your house was really broken into six times in a span of a few months you're probably going to get somewhat paranoid and probably actually start carrying a gun in your house because you never know when somebody's going to break in again. And there is some evidence that Haley Kiffer and Nicholas Brady, the people who Byron Smith later went on to kill, were actually involved in the previous break-ins in his home. And Nicholas Brady was actually being investigated for prior b &Es including one that happened earlier on the day they were killed. Now, by his own account to police, Byron had been visiting neighbors on Thanksgiving when he saw Kiffer, who he suspected was responsible for the previous break-ins in his home, driving around the area. Smith then commented that he needed to get ready for her and then went back home. Smith then drove his vehicle down the road, parking it in front of a neighbor's home, so it looked like he wasn't home. And once he got back to his house, he turned on a recording device, removed the light bulb near his chair, sat down in the basement right beside his gun with a magazine, water, and granola bars, and basically waited for someone to break into his house. So about an hour later, he heard a window break upstairs and Brady climb in. And everything I'm about to say past this point is actually captured on audio. Smith then waited in silence for about 12 more minutes until Brady came downstairs into the basement. Smith then shot Brady twice on the stairs and then later once he fell down the stairs once in the head. He went upstairs and then 10 to 15 minutes later he's heard coming back downstairs into the basement reloading his gun and getting back in the position that he was in before Brady came downstairs. Minutes later, Kiffer entered the home and she is heard calling her cousin's name. And as she made her way downstairs, Smith shot her as well. And once she was shot, she fell down the stairs as well. And after Smith's rifle jammed, he shot her multiple times in the chest with a 22 caliber revolver, dragged her across the floor and set her beside the body of her cousin and then he shot her fatally under the chin. And like I said earlier, audio of all of this was recorded and I'm actually gonna probably put in a clip that I found from another video on YouTube that actually animated what happened and pairs it with the audio that was recorded. Sorry about that. And police were actually not alerted to the break-in or the killings until the next day by one of Byron's neighbors after he called the neighbor asking about a lawyer. And his excuse for this is that he didn't want to bother the police on Thanksgiving. 
And after performing an investigation, the Morris County Sheriff acknowledged that Brady and Kiffer were at Smith's residence to break in and steal. And like I mentioned earlier, Brady was actually being investigated because his sister actually accused him of stealing some of her medication. And evidence recovered from his car was linked to a break in of the residence of a retired teacher the night before they were killed. And Byron Smith admitted to police that he delivered killing shots to the two victims in the head, even though they weren't exactly attacking him at that point. In his statement, Smith said that Kiffer had let out a short laugh after she fell down the stairs saying, if you're trying to shoot somebody and they laugh at you, you go again. And this was before they found the audio tape, but after they listened to the audio tape, it was clear that Kiffer had not laughed at him at this point. She was crying, begging him not to kill her. And like I said, even in interviews with police, Smith said that he fired more shots than he needed to. And once this all went public, a debate immediately started on whether these killings were justified or not. One side argued that the two broke into his home and they basically deserved whatever they got. And the other side argued that after the threat was gone, after he initially shot them the first time and they were wounded on the ground, there was no need for him to actually basically execute them. And I agree with that side. I think he went a little too far with it. And Byron Smith would later state that he had reason to believe that the two were armed in some way, especially since one of the previous times he was, his home was broken into, a weapon was stolen. So in his mind, he believed that they stole that weapon. So they were back to use it. And that is why he used such deadly force. But after they're wounded on the ground and you can see there's no weapon, there's no need to continue to escalate the situation when you could easily just call the police. And I think if you pair that fact with the fact that he was basically lying in wait, the fact that he moved his car so that they thought no one was there. I mean, don't get me wrong, he didn't force them to break into his home. That was a decision they made. But it seems the more you read into this case, the more it seems as though he was just looking for an excuse at that point to kill these two. And of course, I understand that it's easier for me to sit here and say, hey, this is what he should have done. But let's remember that this man was a war veteran. His house was broken into over half a dozen times by his account in a very short span of a couple of months. I mean, for the majority of people, I think for everyone, really, your house is that one place where you feel the safest and where you feel you could be your true self in a way. So to have someone break into your home take your stuff and just like disturb that sort of energy that you have in your house, it's gotta be something that is just messes up your mind in a certain way. And you never know how someone's gonna respond after something like that happens to them. So to not break into his house once, but several times, and then attempt to do it again, and then on Thanksgiving of all days, like what are you doing breaking into a house on Thanksgiving? They didn't, I'm not saying, they didn't deserve what they got, but when you put yourself in a situation like that, you can't really be surprised at what happens to you. Now, do I think this man is justified in what he did? No, I don't. He took it a way too far. He executed these two kids, 18, 17 years old, but that would have never happened if they didn't break into his house in the first place. So both sides share equal blame to me in this situation. And legal analysts later stated that the initial shooting was justified. The first, the first shot that he delivered to Brady and the first shot that he delivered to Kiffer were justified under Minnesota law. But the subsequent shots that he delivered were not justified because there was no longer any threat to him. And that Minnesota law is actually called the Castle Doctrine. And the Castle Doctrine, also known as Castle Law, is a legal doctrine that designates a person's abode or any legal occupied place, for example, a vehicle or home, as a place in which that person has protections and immunities permitting one in certain circumstances to use force up to and including deadly force to defend oneself against an intruder free from legal prosecution for the consequences of the force used. And there's a lot more legal jargon that goes along with that, but I'm not gonna read it. If you want to, I told you the name, it's called the Castle Doctrine. But the synopsis is that in Minnesota, you are legally allowed to use any force necessary against an intruder as long as you are in some type of danger and you are not capable of getting away, safely getting away. And when police started investigating this case in particular, they noticed that a lot of aspects of this 
didn't really fall into the category of self-defense. One of those aspects, like I mentioned before, was the fact that Smith moved his truck to make it seem like he wasn't home. And he later said that he moved it to clean his garage, but it seems as though he just moved it to, so they thought no one would be home at the time. And prosecutors argued the exact same, that he just moved his truck to make people think that he wasn't home. Investigators also found it weird that he recorded the entire situation, and he started the recording before they broke into his house and prior to the break-in in the recording he is heard saying in your left eye and I realize I don't have an appointment but I would like to see one of the lawyers here and prosecutors noted that Kiffer was actually shot in her left eye and prosecutors believe that the last statement was him rehearsing what he would say after he committed these crimes and he did all this before they had even broken into his house and those recordings the evidence that he had planned the shooting along with the excessive amounts of shots that he fired led Smith to be charged with second degree murder. And although he was initially charged with second degree murder, in 2013 they actually changed it to two counts of first degree murder. And law professor Joseph Daly actually commented that the laws surrounding this case actually divided the Little Falls community. In some states, somebody breaks into your home, you are allowed to shoot them dead, period. He pointed out other states such as Florida, like I mentioned earlier, have a standard ground law, but Minnesota has what's known as a reasonable person doctrine. If a reasonable person would see if you are in fear of great bodily harm of death, that's our statute. It comes down to what would a reasonable person see in this situation for Mr. Smith? Basically, what would the average person think to do in this situation? And most people would think, okay, someone broke into my home, I shot them, they're on the ground bleeding. Now I can call the police. So that was sort of the precedent that was used to convict him, that he did more than a reasonable person would have done in the same situation. Guilty on all counts. The Little Falls man who killed two teenagers who broke into his house was found guilty today. As our Scott Sheehan tells us, the decision came the same day as the closing arguments. And on April 29th of 2014, Byron Smith was found guilty and convicted of two counts of first degree murder and also on two counts of second degree murder and the jury actually deliberated for about three hours before coming to that conclusion and Byron Smith was immediately sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole but let's remember he was 64 at the time of this crime 65 when he was convicted so life in prison is like 15 20 years at the most and the audio tapes were actually named by jurors as the biggest influence on their decision that was the most damning piece of evidence in my mind the audio recording of the actual killings and the audio recording of mr smith's interview immediately after his arrest pretty much convinced me that we were dealing with a deranged individual and i believe that if that audio didn't exist the jury wouldn't have been presented enough evidence to rightfully convict him of those crimes but that is the end of this video on the byron smith killings let me know what you guys think about this do you think that he was justified in killing them or do you think that he went overboard like i said earlier i do believe that he went a little too far i don't think these killings were justified in any way i get that his head probably is wasn't in the best state at the time especially since his house is broken into so many times. He was a he was a war veteran in vietnam that was already a pretty crazy war to be in and I, I think the fact that whoever broke into his house stole his father's POW watch, that's pretty, that's really sad. Because that's something that you would expect to keep for your, li for your entire life, pass it down through your family and things like that. So for that to be stolen, I don't know why, that, that just stood out to me a lot. And I get that even you're going to, you heard in the recordings that he... He honestly just wanted to, to me, get revenge on whoever broke into his house and stole his stuff. And I understand that, but you can't straight up murder two people and think that you're going to be justified by doing it. I mean, and I don't know if I'm the only one, but I, this case actually reminded me a lot of the movie Don't Breathe that came out a couple years ago. I mean, it's not as extreme, but it just, the, it's teens breaking into a person's house. He turns out to kind of be ready for him and it kind of ensues from there. But except in this case, he's not as big as of a villain as the character in the movie Don't Breathe. But he is a villain in some way. I understand why some people are like, he shouldn't be in jail. He shouldn't be serving a life sentence for someone breaking into his house. How can you say this is a premeditated murder when he didn't force him to break into his house? But when you look at the steps that he took to make things happen how they happened... 
it does seem it's easy to say that he did plan this in some sort of way. I guess the moral of the story would be don't break in people's houses. And if your house is broken into, defend yourself until you feel as though you are safe enough to get away or call the police. But that is all I have for this video. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to stay tuned for the next video coming Friday. And make sure you guys have a great day, great week, great month, great year. And I'll catch you next video.